Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to today's BetCast, which today is sponsored by Aruba. Today we're going to be speaking about supporting student safety and learning. Uh, we'll be exploring the challenges that schools and universities are facing when developing a robust digital strategy. And today we have six really fantastic presenters for you. So I'm going to hand over with no more ado to Alex Denley, who's Director of Innovation and Transformation at London South Bank University, who will be moderating the session today. Over to you, Alex. Excellent. Thank you, Sarah, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so thank you for attending this afternoon's session and equally big thank you to all of our panellists uh, who joined us today. We've got a really, really uh, interesting topic of conversation uh, and I hope we'll, you guys all get a lot out of it today. So thank you. Um, so see, I'm Alex Tenney. I'm Director of Innovation and Transformation at London South Bank University. Uh, I'll be moderating today and what I'll be doing now is just having a brief intro from our panellists, just a quick intro to themselves and who they are and what they do. So uh, Emma, please, please can you kick us off? Thank you. Okay, good afternoon everybody. My name is Emma Darcy. I'm Director of Technology for Learning at the Children Learning Trust. Um, I'm also on the Senior Leadership Team at Denby High School, which is an EdTech 50 school and an EdTech Demonstrator school. And I think we'll be talking a bit more about that later on this afternoon. Thanks, Emma. Uh, Chris? Oh, not getting Chris, we'll come back to Chris in a second. Greg? Hi there, I'm Chris. Hi. I'm Head of Learning Technology and Innovation for the girls. Excellent. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Sorry, Greg. Hey, I'm Greg Hughes. So I'm Vice Principal for Learning Technology and Curriculum at the De Ferris Academy in Burton on Trent. Uh, and also, uh, like I'm a contributor to the EdTech uh, UK movement and a few other groups. Excellent. Thank you, Greg. Simon. Yeah, thanks, Alex. And hi there, everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining our call today. My name's Simon Wilson. I'm the CTO for Aruba here in the UK and I. And the first thing I want to say is, it's a great pleasure to be able to sponsor this session and hope you enjoy it. Um, so what do I do in my day job? I to talk about uh, technology and strategy. I spend a lot of my time with customers, understanding what their particular challenges are. And I love having a good conversation around the art of the possible. Um, and as a, a great number of our Aruba customers here in the UK are in the educational market, um, uh, hopefully we can have a great conversation today. So thanks, Alex, for having us. Excellent. Thank you, Simon. And thank you, everyone, for the intros. So it's probably uh, it has been a big transformation period in 2020. We've seen a massive um, change in the in the terms of academic delivery and all of the digital technologies that have emerged. Uh, we're going to jump straight into a question uh, and I will allow the panelists to, to give their view uh, of the world in terms of how they've adapted uh, within their business uh, and it's equally even in terms of operational as well. So how can we maintain student engagement and learning via remote platforms? And which technologies have you been using? Uh, I'm going to start that uh, question over to Emma, if I may, please. Okay, I made a few notes just so I'd remember what I was going to say. Um, so I, think that, I mean, when, when we went into um, remote learning at, um, at Denby, one of the things that obviously we had to do, we were very lucky that we already had a system in place. And I mean, I'll hold my hand up now and say we're using we're using Google, we're using Google Classroom. Um, but that's not that wasn't the case necessarily for all the schools across our, our trust. And um, one of the things that we found out very quickly was that um, I think that for remote learning to work, it was really important that there was a sense of engagement there from the teachers. So um, that posting work up onto a website, giving pupils lots of things that they had to download and print, um, that, that didn't work because uh, people need to feel that they're getting something back, they're getting something in return for the work they do. So for us, having a tool like Google Classroom has been really, really useful because it's meant that um, teachers have been able to set work, um, they can actually see which pupils have completed that work, they can give them really good quality feedback on the work that's been done, um, and the pupils feel that there's a point and there's a purpose to what they're doing, because I think that's the hardest thing isn't it when you're not seeing pupils in the classroom is having that kind of face-to-face -face interaction you've got to find other ways to um to replace that but very much i think the idea of um still feeling like you're able to give spoke support to those pupils that need it to sort of tailor what you're doing so they've still got that that personalized attention from you that's that's really important and i think that's one of the hardest things one of the first things that go when you when you move online Thanks, Emma. Um, Greg, how, how have you uh, utilised technology and, and seen in terms of the, uh, the transition? 
Yeah, so we, um, we're we in our ninth year as a one-to-one -one iPad school, so it's quite easy for us. Um, we'd already had a lot of experience doing uh, particularly things like blended learning and assessment for learning as well. Um, so we've done lots of work with staff on digital workflows and, and with students. So for most of our students from year nine upwards, they've all got an iPad. It was very easy to um, you know, switch quite seamlessly to, to them not being in because we just carried on doing what we were doing anyway. Uh, year seven and eight, we um, very quickly produce classes. So we use Shobi um, for most of what we do. And also, you know, like Emma, we, we have been using Google tools for a long time. Um, and again, we adopted the same approach as staff took there. Um, we also put out a sort of list of expectations for all stakeholders, so staff, students, parents, um, support staff on what we wanted everyone to do. And I think that helped provide very clear expectations of where we wanted everyone to go and what we thought they would do uh, to stay involved. Excellent. Thank you, Greg. Uh, Chris, have you got any views in terms of the technology platforms uh, in terms of student engagement and how uh, you've adapted to utilising them? Absolutely. And apologies, I think I'm working on a bit of a lag. So um, I work for a group of 25 schools across the UK. Um, and when we first went to remote learning, what we found, as Emma sort of alluded to, we were having a lot of posting of work um, and a lot of maybe full class discussion with, without a uh, small group collaboration. And so um, one of the things we're working towards now is encouraging the use of technology to um, provide more small group collaborative social opportunities for students. So we're putting that social context back into um, the teaching and learning online. Um, in terms of digital workflow, so as Greg mentioned, that's a really key piece here. And we had sort of some schools that were further down the path than others in terms of uh, where they were in, in storing files and where they were in terms of platforms like Google Classroom or Microsoft Teams. So that's been um, a big focus for us is ensuring that that process is streamlined and that sort of one or the other is chosen so that we can focus back on uh, engaging our students and not on uh, such a focus on the technology itself. Excellent, thank you. So as much as about the technology, and I think um, it's always been important and fair to say that student safety has always been at the forefront of everything that we've done. Uh, more so than ever, um, it's become more and more paramount to manage student safety. But how, how do we do that from afar, uh, largely with the digital technologies that we've got? Um, Simon, have you got any view uh, from the Aruba side in terms of how we could potentially uh, engage and monitor student well-being as well as safety? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thanks for the question. I mean, it, it's a really interesting and challenging area because we absolutely want to keep our kids safe. And obviously, online, they're a, they're a click away from anything. So it's hugely important. Um, and ultimately, it really boils down to how much control you can have or want to have over the, the platform that the kids are using. Um, I mean, if you're lucky enough that they do have, you know, one to one with iPad or a, a you know, Chromebook or some other device, then you can lock it down. You know, you can make sure that you can control exactly what they can and can't see, either through free time or through lesson time or through exam time, which is just as important. Um, but that's not always possible. Um, so, you know, in addition to some of those tools that you, you have, I think one of the things I really would like to see is a bit more effort in, in kind of teaching the kids how to behave online, spending some time during the day, you know, showing them, you know, some what not to do, frankly, how, how, how they should behave, how they should treat each other. Um, because, you know, they're going to be spending an awful lot more time online than they are just in the classroom, right? Um, in fact, you may well get the kids complaining that their, their, their home time is being restricted because their total screen time has increased because of a lesson. So if we can kind of teach them how to behave, um, we can leverage some of the existing tools that we have. And of course, if you have got control of the platform to lock it down during, like I said, free time, lesson time, uh, exam time, then, uh, then you're in a much better position. Excellent. Thank you, Simon. Uh, we've been joined also by uh, Professor Jackie Potter. Uh, sorry, I know you might have missed the first question. Apologies, Jackie. Uh, it's great to have you on board. Um, you do you just want to do a very quick intro to, to who you are so the audience uh, can, can be aware? Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, sorry about that. I had technical difficulties and I think we're all accustomed to that happening nowadays, aren't we, periodically? Um, lovely to be here. I'm Jackie Potter. I'm the head of the Oxford Centre for Staff and Learning Development, which is at Oxford Brookes University. And um, we 
support our staff at Oxford Brooks and also in our partner colleges and actually as a commercial enterprise uh, we support other universities with their um, support for staff who are teaching and that's been a particular area of activity in the last six months since we've all moved digital. Thanks Jackie. Um, I'll give you an opportunity just to answer the first question as well because I'm sure everybody will be, uh, be interested to see your view. Uh, so we were saying um, how can we maintain student engagement uh, via um, distant and remote learning platforms and what technologies have you been seeing emerging or in fact utilising recently? Sure, um, yeah thank you. I, I mean student engagement is so important and I think we sort of started this whole journey of moving to this pivot to online thinking that maybe we'd be doing the same things with the same platforms that we were using when digital wasn't the primary mode of delivery. And actually over the summer, we've had to buy in and change the platforms we've been using um, to make sure that they are robust, that they are offering some of the, I suppose, facilities and features that mean that students will be engaged in synchronous teaching. And we've had to improve the, the robustness of the platforms as well so that they can sustain the traffic actually of the number of people using them. And then on the kind of personal side, we've had to rethink what our kind of pedagogy is for student engagement. So we devised something called the Brooks Framework for ensuring um, digitally enabled programs, which is a discipline agnostic approach to embedding things like community building, clear communications and coherency into the online spaces that we're creating as well as the online classrooms. Excellent, thank you, Jackie. Uh, we've had a question uh, from the audience, which I think I might throw into now, um, and it says, do you think a full-time online school is something that can be done? And will it really, is it really going to um, bring benefits in terms of student education? Uh, I'm going to see, is there anybody who wants to answer that or I can pick somebody, anyone who's got a particular view on that? <laughs> no. can I, about Greg, you're looking... Uh, yeah, you're looking I'm just um, trying to think. It's, it's, I mean, it's an interesting um, suggestion. Um, I think it, it, it's, it's the degree to which you, you, I think Jackie said it, you go synchronous rather than asynchronous. Um, so there's a really interesting um, bit of research that's come out from the Education Endowment Foundation looking at um, the, the different modes that people adopt. And it, its main conclusion is that the quality of what you do is more important than the mode of delivery. Um, you know, and I think on that basis, if you had a very high quality of, of online uh, support for teaching and learning, I think it could be done very well. Um, as long as there's channels for that sporadic questioning and all the other things that we think make great teaching and learning. Lovely, thank you. Um, Emma, in terms of going back to this the student safety side, um, have you got a view in terms of how you've been monitoring student safety from afar uh, now that we're into this kind of hybrid world? Yeah, and I think the key thing is now it's this hybrid world. I mean, in some ways it was actually um, easier when we were in full lockdown and we knew that everyone was out of school. I think the real challenge now is the fact that we have some pupils in school, some pupils um, learning from home and certainly in, in a number of the schools I work with we, we've had that firsthand and I think that's been the, one of the biggest challenges. Um, I mean we took a decision across our trust that um, everyone would have the same platform um, and I'd love to say that was my idea but it wasn't. It was something that I actually heard um, at BET some years previously where I, I was talking to someone else from a multi-academy trust doing a similar role to mine and they said it's so hard to try and manage different users on lots and lots of different platforms and actually the platform you go for really is, is secondary it's 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 what you intend to do with it and one of the things that we found has been really useful has not just been the ability to actually um, restrict certain things that the pupils can access because obviously that's important if they log in with a student account it doesn't matter if they log in on a chromebook or on a phone or on anything else there are certain things they can look at and certain things that they can't but it's also meant that we can open things up as we've needed to you know as, as we've learned more about the um the blended learning as we've learned more about what's what's taking place at home what the pupils want to create and um, we've been able to open up certain extension apps for example that we know are really useful for the, for the pupils to be able to to access and to use so i like the fact that we've had that flexibility um and greg made the point as well it's a really good point it's around um expectations in the first place um i mean we do have a one-to-one -one device scheme we've got about three quarters of the pupils in each of our year groups who've, who've purchased a, a chromebook but we have a 
a Chromebook code that applies to all pupils. Every pupil has to sign a copy of that because it's basically a set of 22 really clear guidelines about acceptable use of that device. And it doesn't just apply to the device itself. It applies to another device you might be using to do the same learning. So we, we sort of tried to set out our stand to begin with, I think, as well, in terms of what is and isn't acceptable behaviour. And then obviously use some of the tools we've got at our disposal, like the fact that, yes, we can see what emails people have sent. We can see if someone's been trying to access an inappropriate website. You know, we can see if someone has accidentally done something they didn't mean to do online. Um, but we don't don't use it so much from the kind of trying to be the big brother and, and blocking things. It's as much as anything, just making a, a safe learning environment, which as Simon said, you have to give the space people to learn in. You know, when you see when you're working with the younger, younger ones, you have to give them a chance to become responsible digital citizens. And they can't do that if you never let them online. So thank you. Um, Simon, just going back to the engagement piece from the Aruba side, have you got a very well, I'm sure that you as a technologist and uh, given the importance of your role, um, what, what are you doing uh, and what are your personal views in terms of maintaining that engagement piece on the technology? Yeah, it's really interesting because I, I've worked remotely and I've worked from home for the for 25 years. But obviously the last six, nine months have been like no other year I've ever known in terms of being so remote and so disconnected from people. Um, and I found that actually keeping adults engaged can be a challenge because we're all on Zoom and Teams and other calls all day long. Um, and certainly some of the some of the things that we found that are very, very effective is you have to keep it interactive. You have to keep asking for feedback, little quizzes, little polls, you know, little points for, for doing things, little breakouts from, from the lesson or the meeting to, 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 to have a conversation, you know, hugely important for kind of keeping that engagement. And I think... Also, the use of two-way video. I mean, we are so much more comfortable in the use of video on calls. I mean, last year, if somebody was on video, that would be nice. But now, if someone's not on video, you really notice. Um, to the point where, you know, having that two-way video so that, you know, the, the, the kids can see the teacher. And most importantly, the teacher can see the kids because they're not that good at hiding there when they're, when they're disconnected, right? You can see it on their faces sometimes. And, and probably the number one thing is 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 make eye contact right i mean you know you've seen how i've been interacting on this call so far because i'm looking around my screen at some of the questions that are coming in but but if i look into the camera and i talk directly into your eyes it's so much more engaging and i think too many people that i interact with fail to see that sometimes they're even looking at a different monitor than the one the camera pointed at and that's hugely annoying um so, so this kind of basic video conferencing video techniques that you can learn that can can enhance whatever it is you're doing um and hopefully that's that's helpful excellent thank you that's really really valid i'm going to start looking at the camera more going forward i think now a bit more engaging <laughs> <laughs> so um so jackie um we, we've obviously kind of become still very much still in this kind of tran transformation period but um and we've still got a long way to go i think i think we're all kind of in this together and learning at the same pace but um how do you um how how would you envisage pre-planning or pre-meditating uh, the usage of edtech uh, and how do you um think of it or try and ensure you've got stability and, and efficiency in everything that you're doing with the, with the rollouts and, and the pace that it's coming yeah it's a it's a really good question and particularly because we changed a lot of our platforms and the technology that we were using as we went into this semester in september from what we had at the uh, outset of the the pandemic and the pivot online so we've got systems and, and procedures in place committees and groups of people who are involved in um both exploring what the new tech might look like that we want to procure and have in our uh, university, but also in terms of looking at and monitoring and reviewing how effective what we've got is for what we're doing now. That committee um, meets regularly and is producing a roadmap and is working very closely with our senior managers who are also saying, well, what are our programmes going to look like, not just in the next three months, but in the next three years and perhaps beyond that? To what extent is this going to transform what we do, not just now until some point when maybe we can go back to the campus and be, be there safely um, in, the, in the rooms and the lecture theatres that we use? But is this going to transform what we do in the long term? So our I suppose our usual systems have kicked into place, but they've um, had to, I suppose, scale up the work that they're doing and speed up the work that they're doing. 
absolutely i can certainly um that certainly hits my world as well in in london south bank uh chris you I mean you, you cover large um large large estates so what, what what about yourself um how, how have you found it in terms of obviously uh pre-planning and premeditating the, the ed tech tra transition to ed tech and um and, and what if it, you know what's happening in your world all of this yeah absolutely so i think just staying on top top of uh, what's happening across the organization has been a full-time job through all of, all of this. And I think one of the key things is uh, ensuring that we're not only understanding what's happening in our schools, but we're also sort of helping create a path forward for our schools. A lot of our teachers are very overwhelmed with the use of technology right now um, because they may be using a lot more digital tools and be online a lot more than they previously were. And so instead of um, having all of our school teachers off in many different directions we've, directions, we've tried to put together a sort of master list of key apps and tools um, for our teachers to use. So as already previously mentioned, the, the platform that distributes files is very important. So ensuring that that's set up at the schools. But then across our 25 schools, also looking at just common tools for things like mind mapping and collaborative virtual whiteboards and um, having a, a few key tools has been really important. Um, this helps us with the training of these tools. I think it's really important too for that cross-pollination across our organization to um, use fewer tools in more innovative ways. Um, so that's sort of what our focus has been, a kind of less is more during these times um, and moving forward. This also enables us to kind of keep better track of, of what is having impact on teaching and learning. Thank you. Um, I'm going to, we've got a, a question from the audience here. Uh, the first one is saying, do, uh, do um, you use a range of tools within the online classroom space? Kind of examples, VLE, Kahoot, uh, is it Lino? Uh, and how successful have they have they been? Uh, is there anyone who want, who's got any specifics they want to mention about the online um, tools that they're using within the classroom? Uh, Greg, is there one for you? Perhaps? Yeah, um, definitely. So we've produced an online learning guide for staff, which covers a lot of these type of um, assessment for learning tools. Um, what we've also tried to do, um, you can find this on our website. You can sort of see that. As, um, we, we've tried to look at the learning cycles that we do um, and what apps and what you know tools will best support various phases of it, whether it's the sort of exit ticket, the demonstrate phase. Um, so again, you can find all of this on our website and I'll share it, but we've focused a lot of our training on that. So we very much see the device as a, like a gateway to you know whatever tools we best see fit. So we don't use a VLA, we use lots of free stuff, um, you know, and a couple of tools that we pay for and really just pick and choose the best um, things that we can for each pedagogical approach that we're taking. Um, so if we want to do effective questioning or we want to look at, you know, concept building or addressing misconceptions, we will find the tools that do that. So I think there's a, a really good range and, and there's lots of uh, very good documentation out there on Twitter and other uh, schools' websites about how they approach these problems. Um, but yeah, I'll gladly share ours in a minute and point you in the, the, the right direction for the start of that. Lovely. Thank you, Greg. Um, Simon, again, going back to you, um, is to, what do you um, views in terms of any advice you can give, uh, obviously, the panellists and all the, naturally the audience as well, in terms of um, ensuring stability and efficiency in terms of some of the technology decisions that they could be making? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think one of the things we have to accept is that the networks that these applications sit on top of are used by a great number of different applications. Um, and whilst there's no substitute for bandwidth, obviously cost and availability sometimes make that a challenge. So it's about it's about making best use of what you've got. Um, if you are in control of the the network itself, they're making sure you're prioritizing the applications that are important to you. But more importantly, that you're deprioritizing the things that you, they're OK to be there. They're just not important. I mean, I'm thinking that you know some of our customers have a real issue because everybody's phone is trying to update all the apps all day long. <laughs> Um, it doesn't matter, doesn't need to happen, doesn't need to happen right there and then, but it's, it's this back low level uh, traffic that's sucking up bandwidth that's effectively meaning that all your real applications have to exist in a smaller space. So you deprioritize that and your better applications, indeed your more priorities applications can, uh, can, can, can work effectively. Um, I mean, that, that's the real challenge. And then of course there's the networks that you don't have control over. So for instance, somebody working from home, 
you know, the student getting online from home, um, indeed staff getting online from home. And certainly one of the things we've certainly seen in the business world is that where you've got multiple people working from the same physical location on a broadband link that really was only there for residential use to begin with becomes a challenge in terms of sharing. So I would say the art of negotiation is going to become hugely important. <laughs> you know, when dad's on an important conference call, um, stop playing Minecraft. <laughs> you know, when it's lesson time, hey, dad, maybe take your conference call somewhere else. Um, turn off some of the things that are going to auto update in terms of your devices, like your laptops and your and your iPads and what have you. And maybe down, don't download files to your Skybox or your Netflix while people are trying to do other things. And of course, if negotiation doesn't work, you can always resort to bribery. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to make sure you get the best use of the, of the resource that you've actually got. I see. I think everybody can relate to just there's nothing more painful than slow internet for sure. Uh, thank, thank you. Really good, really good and, uh, and sound advice there. Um, so I'm going to get into another question now, and I think I'm probably going to let everybody have a little view of this because it's I think it's such it's such an important piece, and, and it's, it's we can all learn from each other's advice. But um, Emma, have, how um, how do you go, or how have you gone about managing staff training, and, and also the confidence level that comes in terms of digital delivery uh, of education virtually? I think for me, it's it's there's really different kind of mixed opinions in terms of this. Some some are just confident and just go get as other people really is quite. As, you know, much as it's technology, it really is a completely different way of delivery. Uh, what's what's how, how, how have you found that? I mean, personally yourself, but or equally within your um, your business as well. Um, I think it's it's such a good question, and I think it's required such a diverse response. To be honest, because um, the starting point I would say is don't assume anything. Don't assume that you know the level that your that your staff are at. Don't just talk about teachers. Think about support staff in schools as well, because often they're using the same systems as everybody else, and the training tends to focus a lot on teachers, and we. Don't don't always remember to train up support staff as well. Um, we started off with a real, when we went into lockdown, I think we started off with a real big um, evaluation project about where all of our teachers felt that they were, where of us, all of our staff were. And it, we, we allowed people to be really honest about their skills because all of a sudden this kind of use of technology for learning, which hadn't been a priority, I think it's fair to say for some staff who kind of felt they would probably not need to make it a priority, was suddenly finding that everybody had to become a certain level of sort of technology experts. So um, what we tried to do was, and again, we used to normally doing training face to face, actually seeing someone in a computer suite or um, actually sort of being able to sit down next to someone and give them one to one training. And of course, all of a sudden you couldn't do that. So our starting point really was finding out um, where everyone felt they were at, whether they felt they really, they were a sort of beginner, intermediate or, or advanced user. And then looking at providing training accordingly. And in some cases, yes, we could do, um, you know, I would do things like sort of remote training sessions for groups of staff where we had schools that suddenly had to move quite quickly onto Google Classroom. We would do training for entire staff teams in one go. But then alongside that, we would also do the one to one support for those teachers who said, actually, I'm a complete Luddite. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't want to put my hand up and say, I, I'm not even sure what's a browser. Where should I be going? What, you know, And those are the stuff that will get left behind otherwise, because your innovators will be innovating. Your staff that have got some confidence will you know, be able to move a bit faster. I think the ones that need the most support, those ones that really are, who, who don't have the confidence. And that is something that you can't rush through either. I don't think, despite the sense of urgency we've had with all of this, um, the fact you cannot rush that through, you've still got to spend that time with those people and give them time. It might be a more condensed period of time, but you've still got to give them time to try things out, to start to use it and to have the support there to help them if something goes wrong. And, and we very much said to staff, you know, one of the things that's great about using all these online tools is you're not printing out thousands of sheets of paper that someone's going to turn around and say, we shouldn't have done that. You know, if you put something on a class on Google Classroom, for example, and you don't set an assignment quite right, you can set it again, you know, just put a message with it. It's okay to make those to make those mistakes. And that's been really important because I think it's been a huge ask of staff to move them as far as we have in the in the sort of six to nine months this year that we've had. And I know staff who I would go into school and see them and they would say, I'm a technophobe, I can't do this, I'm not, I'm, I don't see the point. But who now are actually emailing me saying, let me tell you what I've done this week, let me tell you what I make, you know, so I think I think credit to all the staff in schools and how far they they have moved in this period of time. 
Absolutely, I think that's uh, yes, yeah, big, big, bigger recognition and acknowledgement of, uh, of of everyone. I'm sure. Um, uh, Jackie Oxford Brooks, what about yourself in terms of um, that transition for 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 staff and academic in terms of the the the, the, the new way of delivery? Yeah, um, I think it's been um, not so much levelling up, but levelling down. It's the fact that we certainly all certainly realised that whatever we were doing before, even if it was great, wasn't going to be appropriate or able to be delivered going forward with the online pivot. So everyone started from a position of some ignorance and lack of knowledge. And with that, of course, come, come the concerns about confidence. Um, we did mass delivery of webinars and events to get people looking at what um, the technology could do. And we used that framework I mentioned before to make sure that people had this kind of pedagogy first thinking. So there was the technology may be unfamiliar, but your intentions are still the same. They're to provide a, a good quality education. And these are the features that we say have to be really still there and sometimes even more pronounced when you move online. So that hopefully assuage some of the difficulties with the uh, with the with the confidence and the technology but like i say we we changed our platforms in the middle of the summer so everyone had to learn something new though there, there were no kind of people who could kind of rub their hands together and say we, we've got this um and we provided a lot of support we provided a lot of guidance we provided the idea of buddying so people had a critical friend who who may not necessarily always know the answer but there's someone to go and have a chat with the, the person who you would have previously met by the water cooler or in the staff in the staff common room um your kind of buddy to to try and help you with some of these questions I really like that. I know in, in certainly in London South, and we've got a, what we call a water cooler moment. And I think it is that window of opportunity to just to just have a conversation, right, and just learn from one another. And um, I, I think that's really, really, really important. Um, Chris, I mean, again, you've got a large estate. How, how have you found it? Have you have the um, your colleagues and, and peers, uh, have they adapted well? Or was this was already in flight or, or complete kind of um, just flip on its head kind of approach? How's that gone for you? Well, it's been a very busy time in technology training, um, but I think it's also a really exciting time. So as already mentioned, I mean, the rapidity of change, um, I think have kind of pivoted so many times in such a short amount of time has almost put a lot of people on an even ground, whereas previously we may have had some more tech um, tech star teachers within our schools and, and some who weren't fully convinced. Suddenly we were in this position we were where we were all figuring out how to teach in this remote learning atmosphere. So I think there's a, a panic kind of wore off amongst our teaching staff. I think there's been a lot of excitement in learning a lot of new things in terms of technology and, and the best age are across our group of schools. So when we look at our inset training and our, our CPD pro programs, uh, we look at drip feed and variety. I say those two key things we push. So in terms of drip feed, moving away from those traditional kind of tech trade where you have four hours in a row of just way too much information and then no time to kind of to play around and practice. Instead, we want to be giving lots of bits of information over time and lots of opportunity for our teachers to try things out. Um, also, as a work cooler, I think that's important um, because teachers listen to other teachers. That's whose advice they really want to take. So what we're finding in our schools is um, having a lot of these digital champions or people within the school who are advocating for different tools and, and explaining to other teachers what's really working for them. And it's it's sort of named something different at each school, but that's working really well. And it's not the tech stars you would imagine people be really single out those who weren't fully um, convinced by technology, but have learned this new thing. So we, we try to share that across um, the schools, but also across our organization. So we've started to do virtual training sessions for staff from all of our 25 schools. So we meet virtually and it's a very short segment. We do 25 segments on a particular topic, but then it's the rest of the hour is just time for people and teachers who logged on to share ideas and uh, discuss different issues that they may be having or, or different things that are happening in their schools. So we do that based on tech 
technology topic, but we also do it based on subject. So we may have all of our physics teachers join together and just talk about what works in terms of technology for that particular subject area. Uh, so again, just really trying to encourage that social aspect of being and learning, um, the same as what we're trying to do with our students as well. Excellent, thank you. Uh, I'm going to bring this into Simon into the mix as well, largely from the Aruba side. I mean, I mean, you must have an oversight not only with an education, but all of your client portfolio. Everybody, I think it's it's impacted everyone. To be fair, whatever industry or sector you're in, um, how can you advise um, or, or help us in this journey, Simon? I got your mute. I think sorry. <laughs> There we go. God, you know what? I'm on video conferences all day long and I'm committing for card. <laughs> it's normally me, don't worry. Doesn't <laughs> <laughs> um, do that. Um, yeah, I, one of the things that we often see is that the effectiveness of the delivery is more important than the platform itself. So my advice would be give the staff enough time to get really comfortable with the platform so it's second nature. Because if, if there's areas of the platform they're not comfortable with and they don't know where to move the mouse or to click it, they won't use it. So you've wasted your time. Um, the second thing is, you know, no doubt there are technology companies going to be approaching people with great new tools that are going to transform the way they, that they engage with the students. Um, it will save them a tremendous amount of times. And as my boss has, likes to say, you have to evaluate whether the juice is worth the squeeze because... What you're going to get is you're going to get a very slick demonstration from somebody who knows that platform inside out and they're probably only going to demonstrate a handful of capabilities and you're going to say wow that's fantastic what you have to think about is is how long is it you're going to take for your staff to be as comfortable with the new platform as they were with the old one a bit like learning a new language you know and everything's in a different place in the kitchen right how are they going to how long is it going to take them to get used for that so it may well be that actually a new platform isn't the answer just additional time and help and training with the old systems may actually yield you a much better result. And if you've already paid for it anyway, it's probably going to cost you less <laughs> at the end of the day. Um, so I would say, yeah, new platforms, fantastic. Clearly, you've got some great capabilities, but think about what the impact is going to be on the staff in terms of retraining. I know every time, you know, God bless them, Microsoft come out with a new version of Excel, <laughs> I figure out where stuff moved to, right? And it takes me a while to get back to the same level I was before. So, and that's the same for anybody with any application. So, is the juice worth the squeeze? I would say. Excellent. Thank you. Really, really good. Greg, have you got any comments in terms of this topic? Um, in, in terms of CPD, I mean, we've we've always tried to focus a lot of what we do very hands on. Um, and shape it around the, the pedagogy. So if we're doing stuff on retrieval practice or dual coding or questioning, then we look at how the technology can be a catalyst to do that better, because then I think it resonates with staff and they're more likely to buy into it. Um, so we, we do a lot of that and that's, that's always been really helpful. Um, as a trust, we're doing a lot more um, online sort of training and webinars and things that we can easily, um, you know, send out to you know, 500 staff rather than 150 or 200, whatever it is. Um, you know, I think that's also been really, um, really useful to, to leverage different people's capabilities and then share that. So we've got a bigger team contributing. Um, but I think ultimately, yeah, it, it's just really focusing on the worthwhile. And I think the the other point I would make is I think um, Chris mentioned about iPad champions or technology champions, and we've done that. But what always interested me is if you look at that Rogers adoption curve of, you know, the the super people at one end and the, the laggards at the other it's that critical mass in the middle that i think is the most important so for us trying to gear training around what faculties want or subjects uh, and then trying to address most people um brings them on board and then you're less focused on the extreme ends but you're you're trying to get the whole staff and i think that's worked really well excellent thank you great excellent um, we've got another question coming from the audience, uh, and it's, uh, this is again going back to the, I guess, the student safety. Uh, it says we uh, we were advised not to allow pupils to have their camera on during lockdown due to privacy issues, uh, i.e., seen into a child's bedroom, etc. Is this an issue generally, 
Uh, Emma, um, I'm going to come to you on that. And so if, if that's something that you've been made aware of or, or, or could advise everybody on. Yeah, absolutely. I think that it comes back to what Greg was saying about whether or not you choose to do synchronous or asynchronous lessons. Um, and I don't think there's a, a right or wrong answer in terms of what the best type of learning. I think it very much depends on individual schools. I know some schools that have done live lessons fantastically well. I know other schools that have decided to do pre-records. Um, I mean, the schools that I work at, we decided to do pre-record lessons. Um, and as much as anything, that was so that we could um, really scaffold the lesson well. Because Greg mentioned the EF report and, and very much in there, it's about the quality of the learning, the scaffolding of the lesson. Um, and we looked at a number of things, including things like teacher workload. Yes, things like safeguarding, things like if we were, had one teacher trying to sort of talk to 30 pupils at once at home, would they be able to do the manage the safeguarding, the seeing what was going on? We could, you know, we couldn't physically turn the cameras off. So, you know, that that was an issue. But as much as anything, the wider picture, the things we talked about was um, not all of our pupils have got access to a device at a certain time. So if we were doing a live lesson, would all of those 30 pupils be able to be sat there at the same time online? And the answer was no, they wouldn't. Some of them wouldn't. If they were the younger one in the household, they wouldn't be able to be there. Um, we looked at things like teacher workload. So, for example, if a teacher teaches the same lesson to a number of classes, they could do that lesson five times over to five different classes, or they could do a really high quality pre-recorded well scaffolded lesson and then that could be shared to all five classes and that helped reduce workload when that teacher was potentially at home looking after their their own children at the same time so i think that um the issue around security and safeguarding it is something you've got to be aware of and i mean something that i found some people were saying oh we want to go to do live lessons because it'll be easier you know not not because actually it's a better quality lesson because if we if we do a live lesson we don't have to learn how to use this software that means we then do a pre-recorded lesson and i would say that's not a good enough reason to do a live lesson you know that that really isn't those problems that you might have with using technology are not going to magically go away because you try and replicate what you would do in the in the classroom and you do have to be aware of those issues about if you if you physically are not using a platform that allows you to turn off cameras in in people's homes then yes there is a chance you're going to to potentially see something you know so it's I, I don't I wouldn't say make it all about a risk assessment it's not like that but it's actually about looking at why do you want to do the lesson in that way in the first place is that right for you and your school and your learning environment and your and your pupils you know not and, and then look at all the aspects of it not just is the camera going to be on or off sure thank you um, I'm not sure if any of the other panelists have come across this topic or not if there's any um, feedback that they can provide <laughs> Well, well, only that my own personal experience is that it's much harder to record something and talk to a dead camera than it is to talk to somebody else in the, on the screen that's interacting with you. So, so I do sympathise with some that like to do things live because, you know, you can feed off the energy you get from the from the you know the, the body language and the eye contact you're getting back. But I take the point also that once you've once you've got a, a really high quality lesson in the can, um, being able to reuse that multiple times certainly is a great saving of. Uh, saving of effort. The only thing I would caution is certainly in a business environment, when people are playing back pre-recorded things, you're not as engaged as if it's live. So, so it, you know, like Emma said, there's no right or wrong answer, I think. It's just, you know, down to individual circumstances. Thank you. I just, I'm just going to maybe come in and just say that um, it's, a, it's a really live issue um, for the synchronous online live sessions that we run at the university. Um, and it really is something it's kind of replaced the lecture notes in advance of the session or not question as the kind of absolute chestnut because many staff and many students want the value of interacting and seeing faces. But of course, if you're screen sharing, you can't see um, the, the faces of people anyway. And, and actually what we're trying to do is really encourage this idea again of pedagogy first. So when is it good to see each other? Well, when you're in a breakout room and you're having a conversation with three other people, then that might be the opportunity and the time that you might share it. But when you're in a, a class of 100 online synchronously, then really, if that camera's on or off, it's probably not going to make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move us on slightly now. Uh, so I'm going to um, consider we, we kind of come out of this kind of initial, um, in some ways, kind of an immediate kind of reaction, kind of responsive way uh, to adapt to the new way of delivery and um, largely on the back of, say, since, since, since the pandemic, uh, kicked in more so in March um, and I think now it's time to, you know, an element of stability um, is there but how um, as much as it's still kind of feeding into the immediate requirements 
what are we going to do in terms of um, continuing the long term, the kind of strategy? How has the strategy evolved in terms of the direction of flight pre-pandemic? Uh, and how, in, in, in some ways, as much as we're making sure that we can, you know, the tool sets are there to continue and keep the business and, and, the, and the education afloat as it was before, how can we continue to be innovative? Um, and I'm going to throw that question um, over to Chris initially, please. Sure, absolutely. So I think when the pandemic hit back in March, you know, the the uh, environment or the feeling in our schools was we just need to get through to the summer. Let's just get to the summer. And then we come back in September and it's we just need to make it to half term. We just need to make it to half term. And there was this kind of idea of getting through um, these times. But in actuality, I see this as such an opportunity for schools. Um, to really disrupt what's happening in terms of learning, really leverage technology to change what, what school means in the 21st century. Um, and so in many ways, although some of our plans kind of were on halt while we quickly uh, focused more on technology CPD programming, in a lot of ways, our plans um, are remaining the same. They're just kind of hyperspeed. So the things that we we had planned over, say, a two-year period in our schools, are now rolling out within six months. And so in a lot of ways, it's we're getting more um, in terms of, of innovation across our schools. Um, what we're seeing in, in terms of trends is we're seeing a lot more project-based learning start to emerge. So instead of a sort of uh, teach and do an assignment day-to-day -day kind of pattern, uh, we're seeing more week-long assignments where maybe day one is um, there's a direct direct instruction piece, but day two is just discussion and day three is maybe independent work. And we're starting to see these projects go longer and longer. So we're having even month long projects that are both synchronous and asynchronous. Um, we also have uh, other sort of innovative approaches like uh, design thinking starting to really uh, come through in our schools. So um, things that don't take a lot of technology to set up um, but can be very impactful in terms of when you do bring in technology. So we're seeing a lot of those types of uh, projects come into play. I'm um, also seeing a lot more collaboration. So because we are a group of 25 schools, but we're quite um, spread across the country, we're Newcastle, Brighton, to Cardiff, to, to Norwich, we're actually seeing a lot more collaboration um, and some really interesting projects happening where we not only can uh, have the students interact with those in different schools, but we can bring in experts from different schools into our different projects. Um, and, and uh, we're all looking at different other aspects of uh, maintaining healthy learning environments for our students, like monitoring um, the sort of air within our schools on top of um, uh, ensuring that we're following appropriate uh, clear procedures, everything that's happening. There's, uh, there's been a lot of change. Um, I honestly think that we are getting just a lot quicker than I had been hoped um, we would, and new exciting places I, I wouldn't have thought we would have been in a year ago. So it's exciting times overall, I feel. Lovely, thank you very much. That's really, really good. Um, Jackie, Oxford Brooks, how are you finding it within within your institution? Uh, you know, if you've done any um, kind of immediate kind of, I suppose, immediate uh, responsive kind of changes within um, the technology estate and the digital delivery, but has it changed your view in terms of longer term strategy and, 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 and you know, how's that differed from where you probably were right at the beginning of 2020? Yeah, I, I, I think it has. And it's doing that at a whole range of levels. It's doing it, if you like, for the senior leaders who are thinking about, well, what is the future of higher education or our particular piece of higher education, our university? What does it matter to come to Oxford? How much is that part of the proposition that we make to students when they, when they come and study with us? Um, and so that's kind of an important concept, this idea of place and how much that matters. Um, and then at the level of programmes, the different subjects are, are really having to work hard, sometimes with um, professional bodies and, and other external stakeholders on the curriculum to actually explore, well, well, how can we deliver this digitally? 
if at all. Um, and sometimes it's it's simply that those solutions haven't been found yet um, for some of the kind of practice based medical professions and so on. Um, so so it really is challenging people in a whole range of places in the organisation to think about what does it mean to do more digital and 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 would that be attractive to people or would it be attractive to different people and what does that mean for our our portfolio of of courses and subjects and and where students study with us thank you simon i'm um, going back to the uh, aruba side has it has it i mean we, we're talking about um within our own uh, institutions and schools and what have you what about from an aruba view how do you think um in, in terms of pandemic obviously you've been a technology one of the the, the biggest and, and and most successful kind of technology um, companies out there has it changed the direction of flight from you as uh, as an organization um and, and i guess are you learning from the interaction that you're having with different education boards is that kind of steering your roadmap as such as well yeah absolutely i mean we've always had remote working technologies within our portfolio but it's fair to say that they've certainly been under the microscope much much more in the past six months than ever before i think one of the ways we've been able to help customers is help them reuse some of their existing investments, just point them outwards as opposed to inwards to support remote learning as opposed to localised learning. So uh, that's certainly how we've been able to help. And I think, interestingly, what's happening in the world of business is that the fact that we have had to work remotely has broken down barriers and has opened doors for people to work remotely who would never have been allowed to before. Um, you know, the bosses realised that, you know, just because people weren't in the office, they weren't going to be skiving. <laughs> they, they were actually working, right, remotely. Um, that you know, some of the security fears that they had weren't weren't all founded. It wasn't terrible, um, and I think for a lot of the people that have never had the opportunity to work remotely, they don't want to give that up now. At least not all the time. For surely, for some, absolutely, being at home is not the best place to work. But being at home some of the time to work when they never could do it before, hugely beneficial. But then, of course, I imagine you know the world of education is 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 very very different from a student perspective. Um, you know, kids saying, "Well, why do I have to go to school? I can learn from home, right?" Well, yeah, but you need to go to school because you know you want we need to have, have that interaction with other kids, right? Because that's what they're missing the most. It's that it's the mental health and the inter missing the interaction that's a big deal. And then you move right up to higher education, where I've got a sunned out university who's really grumbling that he's paying the same amount a year and everything's remote, <laughs> um, and he, he can't get access to some of the tools for his course that he would like to do for for some of the practical elements of it because of because of what's happening. So. I think I think certainly moving forward, we're going to see a, a more of a blend of remote and on-site. Um, we should allow people to work and learn remotely if they can, if they can do it effectively. Um, but equally, it shouldn't be a substitute for for getting people face to face and interacting. Because I think after six months of this, and like I said, I've been working remotely for, for for twenty plus years. I can tell you, this last six months has been the absolute hardest because I don't get I don't get the interruptions of going to a meeting. I don't get the downtime of an hour when I'm sitting on a train. You know, to recharge the mental batteries, I don't get to go into the office to uh, to get the juice and the gossip, <laughs> which, is, which is such an important part of work life, right? And and I think kids are the same, right? If you can't interact in the playground, if you can't, you know, meet with your fellow, you know, higher education students, if you can't get the social side of university, then I, I you know, I, I think they're going to suffer. Um, so so I think moving forward, absolutely, a, a blend is what we need to think about, and and and. Um, making the most appropriate use of the technology at a particular time. Yeah, I can absolutely relate to that. And I think it's, it's always, we've always been tasked with delivering the technology to the student, regardless of location and, and having the same experience where they were sat on uh, on campus in my in my situation. Um, and we're trying to, we're actually actively doing that. But on the flip side, we're also giving it, need to give them the reasons to actually still come to campus as well. Uh, and I, can't, I, I take on board all of your comments. You know, technology is an enabler. It's not there to replace face to face. Absolutely. Um, we're almost out of time. So what I, and I want to give everybody an opportunity to, to go around the, around the table in, in terms of my last question to, to the panel. Uh, and that is what makes a good hybrid model for teaching and learning? Um, and I'm going to go to, to, to Greg in the first instance, if I may. Yeah, um, so quite a lot of people in the questions have been talking about engagement and making sure students are actually learning and proving that. So I, I think, you know, for us, a lot of it isn't just the delivery of the content, it, it's how do you check understanding? Um, and I think that comes down to carefully constructing the lessons, which again, it, you know, all of this just boils down to good teaching and learning, doesn't it, with the, the added use of tools. So I, I think really making sure staff have a great understanding of 
what they're trying to achieve and how to achieve it and ensure students are so that that dialogue um we've also found on the staff side um you, you know we've used zoom a lot and zoom breakout rooms have been amazing probably work better than, than physically for us so being able to get them to do you know various hybrid activities get into these virtual groups be really really good and i think that's something we'll exploit a lot more with, with staff and with students thanks greg emma yeah, I was just going to say that I think that, you know, successful um, blended learning, you've got to go into it with the right attitude. I think that um, nobody goes into teaching and says, oh, I want to spend all my time in front of a computer screen. That's, that's not why people people do it. But I think it's accepting that none of us wanted this situation. None of us asked for this situation. We're all having to adapt to it and accepting that um, what we, you know, that it is going to be an ongoing changing situation. Um, and that we're not just looking here at contingency planning, we're looking at trying to incorporate this into longer term digital strategy, whether you're an individual school or a mat or university or group of universities. I think it's having the right mindset towards it. I, I get very frustrated when I read online on Twitter sometimes, people suggesting that, oh, we're trying to say technology should replace normal teaching of course we're not it's it, the, the two can coexist and they can coexist well and we're all just learning the best way to, to facilitate that and to make that happen. Thanks, Emma. Um, Jackie? Yeah, I, as, as the others were talking, I was just thinking we, we have these four guiding principles at Brooks, which um, are things that we are the values, I suppose, of the organisation. And one of them is connectedness. And I think for me, that's absolutely been core through this whole planning for blended delivery and then the move to more digital um, activity and it's not just connectedness between people but at university it's connection to the discipline and to the profession that the students are interested in so that sense of connection that may extend into workplaces it may extend into professional identity and it may extend into the practical work that we do um, around particular professions okay, thank you chris an opportunity for you yeah, in terms of hybrid learning, I think it's so easy to put technology at the center and say that's the most important thing we need to figure out right now. But I think to be truly successful, we need to remember that it's the students, it's the kids that are at the center and should remain at the center. And um, although we may be stressed about the our use of technology, um, we need to ensure that it doesn't turn into a just get your work done and collect work sort of thing that we are here to encourage students to be curious about the world to have a love of learning and um, to have these social interactions as mentioned um, i think it's really important for the, our students through any time to feel like what they do matters and that their voice matters and so if we can leverage technology to ensure that's the case then i think that will be um, a successful hybrid learning. Thank you. And in our final few minutes, um, I'm going to go to Ariba as our sponsor and ask Simon if he had any closing comments on all of the, uh, the, the numerous topics we've covered today. Yeah, yeah. And, and I guess it, it really follows on from, from what you were saying about hybrid learning. Um, technology is a tool. Um, and as one of my, my former CEOs used to say, technology is there to eliminate the constraints of distance and time. Um, it should make things easier. Um, it should make things more fun. You know, it should enable you to do things that you couldn't do without it, but it's not a substitute for doing them. Um, so I think, you know, the, the ideal hybrid model is absolutely to mix things up. It's about mixing up online. Uh, it's about mixing video and audio. It's, you know, it's about um, giving people space to learn. Um, you know, it's about a mixture of pre-recorded things and live things and, and you know, and interactive things as well. Um, and I think it's above all, it's about um, a mixture of time spent online and time not spent online. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, we were very concerned about monitoring screen time before this pandemic started, right? Everyone was, oh, how much screen time is, is the right amount? And we've seen the mobile phone companies add tools to their platforms to allow you to monitor that. Then all of a sudden that's blown out of the water. Why? Because on top of their personal screen time, we've now got learning screen time. Um, so we need to make sure we keep, uh, uh, you know, mix things up a little bit and blend them. Um, technology is a tool. It can do some wonderful things, but it's no substitute, as, as has been said, for, you know, for, for good quality learning, good quality teaching. And I, I still remember the great teachers I had many, many moons ago. Um, I don't think that technology would have made them a better teacher. I don't think it would have made some of the ones who weren't so good better teachers. I think it just would have been hard <laughs> that we did. The, the rising tide, they say, floats all boats. Um, so 
with that, I'm, I'm going to say thank you very much to everybody for their participation today. It's been great discussion, great debate. I've learned a few things and a couple of words I didn't understand, which I'm going to go Google right now. Um, but, you know, this thing will pass. Um, and as I said to a couple of customers the other day, all the things we're putting in place to help us continue with what we're doing whilst this pandemic is here um, will yield benefits when it's gone because I think they will help us emerge better able um, to communicate and interact once we still can physically than, than today when we can't. So uh, uh, thanks everyone for participating. Thanks everybody online for joining the, uh, for the session and, and everybody just stay safe. Thank you very much indeed. Excellent. Thanks, Simon. And on behalf of all the panellists today, a huge thank you. A huge thank you for Aruba for sponsoring the event today. Uh, and thank you. I hope everybody's enjoyed the session and learned something and uh, that we're in it together, as Simon said. Um, here's to the future. Let's keep going and, and fantastic stuff so far. On that note, thank you very much and look forward to speaking to you all soon. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. Thank <laughs> you.